The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth, Chapter Two. The expedition consisted of from six to eight boats, carrying probably about one hundred men. The party in our boat numbered some eight or ten men, among whom were Colonel Johnson, his son Darwin Johnson, Messrs. January, Sims, Kennelly, and others whose names have escaped me. I engaged. In the capacity of hunter to the party, we pushed off, and after a slow and tedious trip of about twenty days, arrived at our place of destination, Galena, to the present day. We found Indians in great numbers awaiting our disembarkation, who were already acquainted with the object of our expedition. The two tribes, Sacs and Foxes, received us peaceably. But being all armed, they presented a very formidable appearance. There was a considerable force of U- United States troops quartered in that region, under the command of Colonel Morgan, stationed in detachments at Prairie du Chien, Rock Island, Saint Peter's, and Des Moines. After nine days, parleying a treaty. Was effected with them, and ratified by signatures of the contracting parties. On the part of the Indians, it was signed by Black Thunder, Yellow, Bank, and Keokuk, father to the Keokuk who figured in the Black Hawk War. In the part of the United States, Colonels Morgan and Johnson attached their signatures. This negotiation concluded, the mines were then first opened for civilized enterprise. During the settlement of the preliminaries of the treaty, there was a great difficulty with the Indians, and it was necessary for each man of our party to be on his guard against any hostile attempts of the former, who were all armed to the teeth. On the distribution of presents, which followed the conclusion of the treaty, consisting of casks of whiskey, guns, gunpowder, knives, blankets, etc., there was a general time of rejoicing, powwows. Drinking and dancing diversified the time, and a few fights were indulged in as a sequel to the entertainment. The Indians soon became very friendly to me, and I was indebted to them for showing me their choicest hunting grounds. There was abundance of game, including deer, bears, wild turkey, raccoons, and numerous other wild animals. Frequently, they would accompany me on my excursions. Which always proved eminently successful, thus affording me an opportunity of increasing my personal knowledge of the Indian character. I have lived among Indians in the eastern and western states, on the Rocky Mountains, and in California. I find their habits of living and their religious belief substantially uniform through all the unmingled races. All believe in the same great spirit. All have their prophets, their medicine men, and their soothsayers, and are alike influenced by the appearance of omens, thus leading to the belief that the original tribes throughout the entire continent, from Florida to the most northern coast, have sprung from one stock, and still remain in some degree of purity the social constitution of their primitive founders. I remained in that region for a space of eighteen months. Occupying my leisure time by working in the mines, during this time I accumulated seven hundred dollars in cash, and, feeling myself to be quite wealthy personage, I determined upon a return home. My visit paid, I felt a disposition to roam farther, and took passage in the steamboat, Calhoun, Captain Glover, about to descend the river to New Orleans. My stay in New Orleans lasted ten days, during which time I was sick with yellow fever, which I contracted on the way from Natchez to New Orleans. It was midsummer, and I sought to return home, heartily regretting I had ever visited this unwholesome place. As my sickness abated, I lost no time in making my way back, and remained under my father's roof. Until I had, in some measure, recruited my forces. Being possessed with a strong desire to see the celebrated Rocky Mountains, and the Great Western Wilderness so much talked about, 
I engaged in General Ashley's Rocky Mountain Fur Company. The company consisted of 29 men, who were employed by the fur company as hunters and trappers. We started on the 11th of October with horses and pack mules. Nothing of interest occurred until we approached the Kansas village, situated on the Kansas River, when we came to a halt and encamped. Here it was found that the company was in need of horses, and General Ashley wished for two men to volunteer to proceed to the Republican Pawnees, distant 300 miles, where he declared we could obtain a supply. There was in our party an old and experienced mountaineer named Moses Harris, in whom the general reposed the strictest confidence for his knowledge of the country and his familiarity with Indian life. This Harris was reputed to be a man of great leg, i.e. a great traveller able to go a great distance in a day, and capable from his long sojourning in the mountains of enduring extreme privation and fatigue. There seemed to be a great reluctance on the part of the men to undertake in such company so hazardous a journey, for it was now winter. It was also whispered in the camp that whoever gave out in an expedition with Harris received no succour from him, but was abandoned to his fate in the wilderness. Our leader, seeing this general unwillingness, desired me to perform the journey with Harris. Being young and feeling ambitious to distinguish myself in some important trust, I asked leave to have a word with Harris before I decided. Harris being called, the following colloquy took place. Harris, I think of accompanying you on this trip. Very well, Jim, he replied, scrutinizing me closely. Do you think you can stand it? I don't know, I answered, but I'm going to try. But I wish you to hear, bear one thing in mind. If I should give out on the road, and you offer me to leave to perish, as you have na name of doing. If I have the strength to raise and cock my rifle, I shall certainly bring you to a halt. Harris looked me full in the eye while he replied, Jim, you may precede me with the entire way and take your own jog. If I direct the path and give you the lead, it will be your own fault if you tire out. That satisfies me, I replied. We will be off in the morning. The following morning we prepared for departure, each man loading himself with 25 pounds of provisions. Besides a blanket, rifle and ammunition each, we started on our journey. After a march of about 30 miles, I, in advance, my companion bringing up the rear, Harris complained of fatigue. We halted, and Harris sat down while I built a large, cheering fire, for the atmosphere was quite cold. We made coffee, and partook of a hearty supper, lightening our packs as we supposed for the following day. But while I was bringing in wood to build the fire, I saw Harris seize his rifle in great haste, and the next moment bring down a fat turkey from a tree a few rods from the camp. Immediately reloading, for mountaineers never suffer their guns to remain empty for one moment. While I was yet rebuilding the fire, crack went his rifle again, and down came a second turkey, so large and fat that he burst in striking the ground. We were thus secure for our next morning's meal. After we had refreshed ourselves with a hearty supper, my companion proposed that we should kill each turkey to take with us for our next day's provision. This we both succeeded in doing, and then, having dressed the four turkeys, we folded ourselves in our blankets and enjoyed a sound night's sleep. The following morning we breakfasted off the choicest portions of two of the turkeys, and abandoned the remainder to the wolves, who had been all night prowling around the camp for prey. We started forward as early as possible, 
and advanced that day about forty miles. My companion again complained of fatigue, and rested while I made a fire, procured water, and performed all the culinary work. The selected portions of last evening's turkeys, with the addition of bread and coffee, supplied us with supper and breakfast. After a travel of ten days, we arrived at the Republican Pawnee villages. When what was our consternation and dismay to find the entire place deserted, they had removed to their winter quarters. We were entirely out of provisions, having expected to find abundance at the lodges. We searched diligently for their caches, places where provisions are secured, but failed in discovering any. Our only alternative was to look for game, which, so near to an Indian settlement, we were satisfied must be scarce. I would break my narrative for a while to afford some explanation in regard to the different bands of the Pawnee tribe, a subject which, at the present day, is but imperfectly understood by the general reader, the knowledge being confined to those alone who, by living among them, have learned their language and hence become acquainted with the nature of their divisional lands. The reader perhaps has remarked that I related we were on a visit to a Republican Pawnee village. This is a band of the Pawnee tribe of Indians, which is thus divided. The Grand Pawnee Band, Republican Pawnee Band, Pawnee Loops or Wolf Pawnees, Pawnee Picks or Tattooed Pawnees, and Black Pawnees. The five bands constitute the entire tribe. Each band is independent and under its own chief, but for mutual defence or in other cases of urgent necessity, they unite into one body. They occupy an immense extent of the country, stretching from beyond the Plate River to South Arkansas, and, at the time I speak of, could raise from 30,000 to 40,000 warriors. Like all other Indian tribes, they have dwindled away from various causes, the smallpox and war having carried them off by thousands. Some of the bands have been reduced to one half by this fatal disease, in many instances introduced designedly among them by their civilised brethren. A disease more particularly fatal to the Indians from their entire ignorance of any suitable remedy. Their invariable treatment for all ailments being a cold water immersion, but it is not surprising that they are eminently unsuccessful in their treatment of the smallpox. Horse stealing, practiced by one band upon the others, leads to exterminating feuds and frequent engagements, wherein great numbers are mutually slain. The following interesting episode I had from the lips of the interpreter. Some thirty years ago, during Monroe's administration, a powerful Indian named Two Axe, chief counsellor of the Pawnee Loop Band, went to pay his great father, the president, a visit. He was over six feet high and well proportioned, athletic build and as straight as an arrow. He was delegated to Washington by his tribe to make a treaty with his great father. Being introduced, his father made known to him, through the interpreter, the substance of his proposal. The keen-witted Indian, perceiving that the proposed treaty talked all turkey to the white man and all crow to his tribe, sat patiently during the reading of the paper. The reading finished. He arose with all his native dignity, and in that vein of true Indian eloquence in which he was unsurpassed, declared that the treaty had been conceived in justice and brought forth in duplicity. That many treaties had been signed by Indians of their great father's concoction, wherein they bartered away the graves of their fathers for a few worthless trinkets, and afterward their hearts cried at their folly, that such Indians were fools and women. He expressed his free opinion of the great father and all his white children, and concluded by declaring that he would sign no paper which would make his own breast or those of his people to sorrow. Accordingly, 
two acts broke up the council abruptly and returned to his home without making any treaty with his great father.